All right. So I wanna welcome everyone uh, to the UCLA School of Nursing. This actually should say fall 2020-22, right? Oh my gosh, can't believe we're already getting ready to start um, admitting students for fall 2020-22. Um, so, sounds so weird, I should just say 2022 instead of 2020-22. Or see, guys, I'm getting that totally wrong. Um, but again, just wanna welcome everybody. This is the PhD admissions information session. And so, hi, my name is Mark Coven. I am the Director for Recruitment, Outreach, and Admission. And you'll see Dr. Wendy Robbins. Uh, she will be joining us in about a couple minutes. Um, but what I want to do for today is let you guys know that we will um, be going over the specifics for this program. We want you to know everything that it entails. Okay, so that's today's purpose, to make sure that we can share all the information that you need in order to uh, walk out of here. Uh, within the next couple of hours, knowing exactly what our program entails, how to apply, how we can help pay for it, um, and how we can make sure that you can be a, a successful student. So as you guys know, uh, PhD is an acronym that we all use, and it stands for Doctor of Philosophy. Okay, so here at UCLA, we use a lot of acronyms, um, so that is definitely something that you guys will be getting used to. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about today's agenda. So as you see, our goal is to make sure that we get you guys out here before 3.30. And so here's a little breakdown of what it's gonna look like. And so we're gonna to hope to try to stay on time, but no matter what, we're gonna make sure to get you guys out here before 3.30. And so I'm gonna go ahead and continue for the next couple of minutes, um, going over the welcome and the introduction. And then Dr. Winnie Robbins is gonna go ahead and take over and she's gonna provide some information on the program, the mission statement, the focus, um, as well as other things that we feel is important for you guys to know. And then I'll jump back on and I'll talk about the admissions and application process. We'll have Leonie Thomas, who's our new director of financial aid, go over the financial aid portion, um, how much it costs, but how we can make sure that we can help pay for it for you. And then we're going to do like a little brief, maybe, you know, 10 to 15 minute kind of intermission in a sense. And this is where we want to answer any additional questions that you guys may have um, about the program. And then we're going to go ahead and transition it to our faculty panel. So this is where we have about five faculty are going to be joining us today, and they're going to be talking about their research um, and also at the same time help answer any questions that you guys have. And then we're going to go ahead and finish it off uh, with our student panel. So we're also going to have three students join us today, um, and they're going to talk about um, their time so far uh, being nursing students, being doctoral students, and then you guys can also ask them questions about what the life is like of being a student as well. Okay, so a lot of people ask why UCLA, right? And so what I always like to say is that UCLA is a small community within the big city of Los Angeles, right? And so the same thing can be said within uh, the UCLA campus in terms of the School of Nursing. Here in the School of Nursing, we think we're our own small community within the big realm of, of UCLA. What does that mean? We have about 600, a little over 600 students in the School of Nursing, but that ranges from our undergraduate program all the way through up to our graduate programs. So we are a small program. But with that, as you see the third, well, the second and third bullet, um, even though we're small, what we like to say is that we're mighty. And we have all the different type of resources that we have available to make sure that not only are we one of the top nursing programs, um, teaching programs, but also in NIH funding. And so with that, just naming some resources that we have, um, we have, of course, you know, you're going to have your faculty advisor. You even have a mentorship program to what we like to do is match up a first year PhD student with a second year PhD student and so forth. And that way you guys can move together um, along throughout your time of being a student at UCLA to make sure that they can help you in any other way that they can. If it has to do with maybe there's some books they can help lend, if there's study habits, Whatever the case is, uh, what we wanna do is make sure that not only are they gonna be a mentor, but it's someone that you could befriend as well and you guys can move forward. We have tons of other resources that we'll be talking about, um, but I think with that and just the rich environment that we have within research, this is one of the, um, one of the times where we like to boast a little bit um, and say that all the hard work that we do, it comes out to being one of the best grad schools. And so with that, I will go ahead um, and like to introduce Dr. Wendy Robbins, and she's going to start going over the introduction of the school. She's going to provide a mission statement, the goals of the program, and making sure that you guys can understand the focus of the program as well. So without further ado, Dr. Robbins. Thank you, Mark. Um, so welcome, everyone. Uh, we're happy that you joined us to hear about 
our UCLA School of Nursing PhD program and why this is the place for you to pursue your research doctorate. Um, as this slide says, my name is Wendy Robbins. As Mark said, I am the director of the UCLA School of Nursing PhD program. And I welcome all your questions now and um, even uh, after the program to email me. I would love to uh, hear from you. So next slide. At UCLA, our mission is to lead and transform nursing care and nursing science. And we do this through offering an academic program that's taught by renowned professors in nursing science, philosophy, theory, and both quantitative and qualitative research methods. We're well known for both quantitative and qualitative research. Um, one of our uh, things that builds our strength is the very strong collaboration that we have with UCLA Health. UCLA Health is ranked number one in California and third in the nation. We also have very strong partnerships with our greater Southern California community. This is one of the most rapidly changing and diverse communities in the nation. And we also have strong relationships on campus with our research partners and the research enterprise. Uh, UCLA gained more than $565 million research dollars uh, for the coming year. Next slide. Um, so specifically, the graduates of our program are prepared to conduct original research, uh, test theory across multidisciplinary environments, and we expect that they will impact healthcare policy through their research and scholarly work. And above all, they do all of this and lead with cultural competence and ethical decision making. Next slide. This is just a, a pictorial overview of the curriculum, but if you look at it, it's all about scientific inquiry. That's what the PhD is about, scientific inquiry. And uh, you can see starting at the bottom, uh, we will talk about philosophical assumptions, the state of the science going around following the arrows, You'll learn about theoretical frame, frameworks and how to frame a research question, uh, data collection and methodology, research methodology is taught, and then how to interpret and discuss your findings, and then finally disseminate your research. Next slide. So if we take a deeper dive and look at what will happen <laughs> when you're here, this is the basic core of the classroom courses. And it's um, what you can see is it's by fall, winter, and spring. So we have classes fall, winter, and spring, but not summer. Summer is a time for you to um, work on your research and your reading. Uh, so in fall, we start with basic philosophy and a critical review of the science in nursing. Uh, there is also a chance for you to take an education seminar and education practicum. That's important for people who want to, upon graduation, go into academia. So you'll get a chance to actually work with the professors here. And uh, as they teach a course, you'll be able to be mentored. Uh, you also take a biostatistics course. Biostatistics continues in the winter and you go deeper into thinking about concepts in uh, nursing and you learn more about the state of the science of nursing and you get an introductive, introduction to qualitative research. Spring, first year. You just latch on to that theory development. You go deeper. And you also have a seminar on ethics. 
and you get an introduct introduction to quantitative research designs. So at the end of your first year, you've been introduced to the basics. You take a written qualifying exam. Then you enter your second year. You continue with more statistical uh, courses in fall and winter. You have a grant writing course and um, you learn more about how do you measure things? How do you measure things in research? And then you have a chance to take cognates and elective courses um, to uh, get a feel for what is available in the area you're interested in, but across the campus at UCLA. Next slide. Following this, you will start on mentoring with different faculty and learning about how you conduct research through being part of their research teams. Following that, uh, you will take, um, you will choose a dissertation chair and put together your dissertation committee and prepare for the um, oral qualifying exam. Students who want to go deeper into qualitative research will also find this a time where they can take the advanced qualitative courses. Um, and let's see, of course you take and pass your oral qualifying exam, and then you actually begin doing your research. <laughs> okay, so next slide. Yes, we'll get to the next slide. I have a, um, there is one question that's in the, oh, yes. in the chat. Um, so someone is asking, can they take courses during the summer? Oh yes, you may take courses during the summer and many students do. Uh, it's it's um, the time when students will reach out and take electives or their cognate courses. So let's say you're interested in looking at um, questions about, um, uh, oh, you know, pain management, and, and you want to look at different ways that this is dealt with, um, that might be a time during the summer when you might reach out and take a cognate to learn more about this. Uh, and if you were interested in social determinants of health, UCLA is renowned for its uh, researchers and academia in, in this area of research. And so that might be a time where you would take a course, say, in public health um, related to social determinants of health. And with another follow-up question, um, mm -hmm. will most of these courses be done in person or online? Um, or is online uh, learning an option? Um, I think mm -hmm. it's a good question just because of right now we're still currently in the pandemic. Um, so I guess part of this will be kind of foreseen in the future. Um, but as of now, could you maybe give them an idea of, of what learning is like? Mm -hmm. So uh, there are courses that are taught um, hybrid, where you may meet in the classroom, uh, but also at other times you would meet on online. Um, and that could be do, done through a Zoom format. Uh, it could be synchronous where everybody meets together. Sometimes it's asynchronous where uh, there'll be recorded lectures that you could do online as well. Awesome, thank you. So let's go ahead and continue. So what are the advantages? Well, um, the classes are small. Uh, that means that you have access to your professor, you know, face on face right there, small classrooms talking, whether it be in a Zoom format or in person. Um, the course days and times, you can take a look at those uh, on the um, registrar schedule of classes. You type in nursing and then you can see what's taught in the fall, the winter and the spring. One thing that we like to mention to students who are coming in is that it is a commitment. Uh, the PhD program is going to be something like 
nothing you've done before. You're going to be thinking about things in a way you've never thought about things before. And so we give a rule of thumb for each unit that you sign up for. Plan to spend at least three hours working on that class outside of the classroom. Um, so, you know, it's not just coming and learning and discourse, which is all enriching and we love it, but it's going also on your own time and reading and thinking about things and, and you know, writing out things and rewriting out things. So um, 14 units would be 42 hours of time devoted to your studies. And uh, that's usually what you take is about 14 units a quarter. Consider it full time. Working full time while trying to be in the program full time is not recommended um, because you'll miss out on this very special time of your life when you really get to go into depth about nursing and nursing science. So thank you. I think that was my last one, right? Oh yeah, that's it. But Dr. Robbins will definitely be back with us later. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just want to say thank you for that. Was and, there... um, go ahead. Go yeah. Ahead. Questions for me before I leave? Yeah. yeah, that's exactly what I was going to ask. Let's see. Okay. <laughs> Mark, um, you read my mind. Yeah. Okay. So here's one. Um, someone is saying, I have a DMP. Is there any credits from my DMP program that would count towards the PhD program? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, so we are welcoming, you know, um, this at UCLA. We haven't uh, actually written out a curriculum yet, but we, your curriculum would probably be very similar to the APRN to PhD program. Um, it's a DNP program, and I know that you've done a scholarly project. So, but, but uh, as we have it now, our APRN program is streamlined compared to students who enter with a BS to PhD or a master's um, without the APRN to PhD. So yeah, this is a great question. I'd love to talk to you more about it. And awesome. um, that is the other thing I should mention. I showed you a curriculum, but um, there are many ways for students to get to where they want to be. Uh, we do have processes in place where you do get credit for things you've done before. Hope Thank that you. answered the question. Oh yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Let's see, I think we have another one coming in. Okay, we have a couple more. All right, um, someone else is asking, I am finishing my BSN, working on my undergraduate research now, and I have had my LPN since 2014. Do you recommend getting more, ex more experience uh, before trying to enter a PhD program? What I would say to you is if you feel you're ready, then you should apply. Um, so sometimes people, you know, we're all different. We come with different experiences. And um, so if you feel that you've been in the field and you have some research questions that interest you at this point, I think that you should go ahead and apply. Um, uh, or reach out to professors here first and speak with them and see what they say uh, about applying. But um, yeah, we'd love to talk to you about it. Yeah, yeah, great question, uh, Shaylin. I was also gonna say too, uh, a little later, we're gonna have our faculty panel. So definitely mm -hmm. feel free to bring that question back up uh, just to kind of see what others you know, say about it. Um, but definitely like Dr. Robbins was saying, if you feel like you're ready, go ahead and apply. Um, <laughs> the, the main thing is, yeah, it's always when you're ready to apply. A lot of people always think the experience is, you know, is something that's vital. It is something we like at, but no, we want to make sure that if you have an interest in research, you have an idea of what you want, and we can match you up with a faculty advisor, I think that's the best way to go. So there is one more question, but let's, we, well, I'll go ahead and, and, 
and say it, but I think this might be another question that we can wait for the student panel. Um, but Dr. Robbins, what do you think about this though? So Lisa is saying um, that she agrees that most PhD students should not work full time. Um, but she's saying, is there a recommended number of hours for past students that have worked um, when they were previous students? I think what you should do is look at the number of units you're taking, figure out how many hours outside of class that's going to take you, look at the rest of your life, because we know you don't just materialize here. You come from, you know, a life. Uh, many people have uh, families. Uh, um, many people are, um, you know, doing other activities. Um, so look at what, what you have to do, what you need to do, and think about how many hours then you can work. Um, usually students will go uh, reduce their work to maybe one one you know shift per week um, sometimes two but but students who who um, have other obligations um, that you know two may be too many yeah. so it's very individualized but indeed ask the students they've lived the experience definitely okay we have one more question coming in i think this is a pretty good one uh jonathan uh said that he was part of the meet the dean um i think what was an event that happened uh recently and dean john had mentioned um the initiative to increase the emissions for both the phd and dmp program um and making sure that the processes are easier uh to making sure that students can obtain a phd at a more timely manner um and so he's asking if you know of any efforts of what the phd program is doing to decrease the time for students to obtain their degree yeah, so we are um, uh, looking at the way the courses are structured, and we are looking at um, increasing uh, the amount of mentoring, re research mentoring that we give and starting it earlier in the program. We feel that uh, students who get exposed to research earlier in the program um, move a little faster. And the faculty is really uh, um, interested in getting uh, the students to graduation because we need this pipeline. Um, faculty are, are uh, sparse, right? And we need to get more PhD prepared people out there uh, for the um, uh, nursing profession. Thank you for that. And also thank you, Jonathan. That's a great question as well. Yeah, great question. Yeah. Okay. So what okay. we'll do is Dr. Robbins is definitely gonna come back. And so I know you guys will have more questions. Yeah. Um, so we'll let, we'll go ahead and let her go for now and then we'll continue on with the admissions process. And Dr. Mm -hmm. Robbins will be seeing you soon. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. All right. So great, great. That's a great start to this info session. I'm really excited about this. Oh, let me back up. Sorry about that. Let's, there we go. Um, so before we, we move forward, let's kind of think about um, maybe like today's theme in terms of how did I find myself in this path towards research? Um, how do I find this path in towards nursing research? So give that some thought um, as we continue throughout the uh, information session. And this is also going to be a question that I'm going to ask our faculty. So how did they get to um, being pre-nursing pre students? to going through, you know, all the way through a doctoral program? And what was um, their thought process in terms of how did I get to research um, and why am I continuing it now? Because as you guys know, you guys are all here today thinking about um, continuing education, nursing research, and it's gonna be something that you're gonna be doing for the rest of your life. So kind of give that some thought as we move forward. But for now, let's go ahead and uh, continue with the application process. So I'm not sure um, of you that are joining us today, are gonna be interested in applying for this upcoming fall, uh, fall 2022, ah, I said it there. Um, but if you are, we want you guys to make sure uh, that there is a process in terms of how to apply. So if you guys have started the application or not, the way to get to it is by going to grad.ucla.edu. And in there, that's where you're gonna be able to find our nursing application. So as you start it, 
you're going to go ahead and select an application type. Okay, so there's new, there's readmission, and there's renewal. So readmission, well, basically new is for anyone who's applying for the first time for graduate study here at UCLA. Readmission is for someone who has applied for graduate studies, was admitted, but unfortunately did not register for class and or did not do a leave of absence. So for that person, they would be applying for readmission. A renewal is for someone who's actually graduated uh, from UCLA in a, in a graduate program. So maybe someone who's received their MSN um, or maybe their um, MPH, whatever the case is, they will be applying for renewal. So there may be most of you guys out there that are gonna be applying for new. And as you do that, you're gonna wanna make sure that you're selecting the correct major slash program. And in that, you're gonna wanna select nursing PhD. By selecting nursing PhD, it's then gonna move you to the correct application. We have other graduate programs. We have a nursing um, MECN, which is our master's entry program. We have a nursing MSN APRN, which is a far advanced practice. And then we also have our nursing DMP, okay? So there are three other different graduate programs. So we wanna make sure that you guys are gonna select the right one. And that's gonna be the nursing PhD. So this is vital as well as making sure that you're selecting the correct um, major slash program. And I see a question coming in here. Um, can you start the application and save it? Uh, yes, you can before submitting it. So yes, you can. That's a great question, Karen. Uh, you can start the application now if you like, just to get it started, jump start it, um, enter this information, even put in your basic you know, biographical data and information like that. So you could do that. Um, and then you can save, you can exit, come back at a later date. And so yes, it will hold your place in line. So that's a great question. All right, and so I see another good question here. Um, so yes, if you are a Meccan graduate, you would be applying for renewal. It's a great question, Ari. And hi, <laughs> good to see you. Okay, so let's move forward. Okay, so for the academic history and transcript section, this is where we're gonna want you to put in chronological order, the highest education that you received. And so typically here is where they're only asking for the four year institutions. So for those of you who have an MSN, you're gonna put your MSN. And for those that also have a BS or a BSN, you're also gonna put that there. So typically what it's saying is that you don't necessarily have to put um, your community colleges or a place where you might have even received an AD in. You don't necessarily have to put that here in the academic history section. We would though ask for you to upload your unofficial transcripts, okay? So again, as you put your, your, your four-year institutions in the academic history, we're gonna also ask that you upload the unofficial transcript, okay? So again, you'll put it for your master's if you have one, and you'll also put it for your undergraduate programs as well. You can also put your um, uh, community college or your AD in as well, but it's only gonna be here for the unofficial transcript section. The good thing now is that um, grad division did change uh, the requirements in terms of the transcript. So what they're saying is that you can upload the unofficial and that will suffice for now in terms of the admissions process. But once admitted into the program, that's where myself and my office will ask for an official transcript. And so that will help us complete your admission into the PhD program. There are a lot of universities that are now doing electronic transcripts. And so that is helpful. Um, if they could do that, that'd be great. It comes to us a lot sooner uh, than hard copies. But if your institution does not do a hard copy, it's okay to have it uh, mailed out as official. It just would have to be sealed. And let's see. I have another question here. Oh, okay, that's a good question. I will get to that um, as we move forward a couple of the slides, but, but that's a great question here. So I'm gonna go ahead and leave it and I'll come back to it. Okay, so let's talk about the statement of purpose. So have, as you guys know, or may not know, there's gonna be two essays, pretty much um, in terms of what you're gonna have to submit in the application. The first one is gonna be the statement of purpose. And so the statement of purpose is where you're going to provide information um, about yourself as um, in terms so you can uh, demonstrate your ability to express your ideas um, in, in terms of the different questions that, the, that they're going to be asking. Um, there's about eight questions, and so I'll go ahead and list those off. But what they're saying is if you can re respond with about 250 to 300 words, um, that'd be great. No citations necessary. So it's really just going to be, you know, free flowing format. Uh, but you definitely want to make sure that it's organized, right? And so with that, the first question is going to be your reasons for graduate study, right? So not only is it um, your reasons for wanting to get a PhD program or apply to a PhD program, 
or why are you wanting to apply to UCLA's PhD uh, program? Okay, so you definitely want to describe that in terms of nursing and making sure that you want to express why nursing and why a PhD. And then you also want to um, answer in terms of the information uh, that is needed in terms of your background uh, that can include training or any type of experience um, that you feel um, has made it so you are qualified for doctoral studies. Moving forward, we want you to also provide a balanced assessment of your personal characteristics, uh, which can include your strengths. You'll even include your weaknesses. Um, and, and if that, if you have any weaknesses, you want to talk about how you can improve those as well. We also want you to describe how these characteristics have influenced uh, your individual or group interactions, a particular emphasis on the interpersonal style, right? As you guys know, we're really big on leadership. So not only research, but we're also big on leadership. We also want to talk about membership qualities and other characteristics that you feel um, have influenced you and how others can also view you as well in terms of the different influences that you have. Uh, we also want you to briefly describe a, prog a problem in nursing science um, on which you would like to focus in terms of your research. Oh, let me back up, sorry about that. Um, and then also with that, you wanna make uh, sure you can add how you plan on contributing to it, right? So it looks like you're having a research interest uh, in terms of maybe a problem, but what can you do to contribute to making it better and then to improve it? Going on to number seven, uh, how do you expect doc doctoral study at UCLA to facilitate your goals? So that's the main thing, right? So we're talking about like, why do you wanna get into a PhD program? Why do you wanna to apply to UCLA? But what is it about UCLA and our graduate program that's gonna help you get to your goals of continue on, continuing on entering and graduating uh, with the doctoral uh, degree here at UCLA? Uh, and the last one, we want you to strongly, um, well, we strongly encourage you to discuss your research interests related to your doctoral studies with a UCLA faculty member, definitely before you apply, okay? And so that's why we also have our faculty research panel um, in, this, in this information session, um, because if there are one of our five panelists on here that has a research interest aligned with yours, we definitely want you to reach out to them. And if not, on our website, we have a full list of our faculty um, that provides their research interest in what they have. And so if there's any that aligns with you, we definitely want you to reach out to them. We think this is really imperative as you move forward um, and getting ready to apply uh, to UCLA is making sure that we can have a, um, a member, a faculty member um, who can potentially be your advisor, okay? So that's one of the main things there. And you could do it by contacting them. You could send them an email. Uh, what I always suggest is reaching out to them. You could set up a Zoom meeting. If this was before the pandemic, you know, I would say, you know, take them out um, for a coffee. Um, but, you know, doing a Zoom meeting is, is just... Um, as influential is just as important. So you could do that as well. But I think continuing that conversation uh, would be great. That way, you know, when you get ready to apply, you feel pretty confident that not only would you be able to be admitted into the program, um, that you would have success as you continue moving forward as well. So let's pause here, because I do see some questions. Okay. Ah, okay, so yes. So just to clarify, um, how are you going to contribute to making the research problem of your interest better? So yes, yes, just to clarify that, yes. So if you have a research interest, um, if you think it is also a problem in society, um, that it might be globally or might be within our own community, how do you, how do you think your research um, can contribute to making it better? So yes, thank you, I'd wanna also clarify that. And so yeah, that can also, also mean in terms of the school, your classmates and your community. So thank you, Ari, those are great questions. Okay, so let's move forward to the personal statement. So the personal statement um, is a little bit different from the statement of purpose. So you definitely wanna make sure that your answers are not gonna be duplicated and not gonna be the same. So for statement of purpose, I always kind of say, it's like you know, self-explanatory. So this is where an area to where you're gonna be able to get personal about yourself, right? So the statement of purpose really wants to know about your reasons for wanting to apply to UCLA, wanting to apply to a doctoral program, what your research interest is, um, and how you feel it's going to help, you know, your community and your areas of wherever it is that your interest um, nursing research lays. But within the personal statement, this is where we really want to get to know who you are, right? So in this, it's going to be about a page long. Um, it's going to be, I might, it might say 500 words, um, but 
if you can make it a page so you can exceed the 500 words, I would say just make sure it's a page, single space, 12 inch, 12 inch font. Um, Times Roman numeral typically is what it would be. Um, but with that, we want you to describe your background, any accomplishments, any life experiences um, that you have gone through that have led to your decision to want to apply uh, to doctoral studies. Okay. With that, we want you to include any educational, personal, cultural, economic, or social experiences um, that you've gone through. It could be challenges and also explain how those challenges are relevant to your academic journey. So what are the things that you've gone through that have gotten you to where you are today? Um, with that, we also want you to talk about any experiences um, that, you've, that you've had um, in terms of challenges. Uh, so you could talk about maybe being first generation. Um, so first in your family to graduate from college, you can also be the first one in your family to pursue a doctoral study. We want you to also talk about that. But we also want you to talk about any diversity um, and multicultural experience that you've witnessed or have experienced as well. Okay, so some examples would be like a public service. So if you're part of any organizations or associations, um, you know, within your work setting, so your professional setting or personal. So uh, if it's you're part of any other type of church, uh, sorority, fraternity, things that do good uh, within the community, we want you to talk about those as well. Okay, so as you can see, there's, there's a slight difference between a statement of purpose and the personal statement. Before I move on to the resume slash CV, are there any other questions that you guys may have about that? Go ahead and feel free to put it in the Q&A um, and I'll go ahead and move forward. Okay, so as you guys all know, um, how to write a resume slash CV, what we want you to do is highlight your educational experience in terms of the honors. Uh, you can include your work experience, your volunteer experience, your extracurricular activities, um, anything that is professional in terms of organizations or associations. Uh, typically, people think that the resume has to be a page because typically that's what a work resume looks like. Um, but for us, uh, for educational setting, your resume can expand to about two pages. Um, because in this, we want to make sure that you guys are going to be able to include all the information you feel is important um, for our uh, reviewers to know. So. In that, you could talk about any type of leadership experience, community service, again, volunteer experience, or any other creative experiences that you've also been able to obtain. Okay, if you can, make sure that you can put that in chronological order as well. Okay, so here are some other things that you can also list in your resume slash CV, right? So any certifications that you guys have. Of course, you're going to put your license in there. So you're going to put that. Um, let's see, scholarly and um, honors received. So you put that, any publications, definitely want to put that as well. And if you're invited to do any lectures, you definitely want to put that in there as well. So make sure that you make sure to put your resume slash CV, make it robust as, as much as possible. Okay, so I think that's the most important thing is to make sure that it's most um, fluffy as possible that way. Um, the reviewers have a great idea in terms of who you are. Okay, so let's move forward for the letter of recommendations. What we're gonna ask for is three letters of recommendations and we want them to be from professionals. So if you have um, someone who is in a supervisory role, um, someone who is a professor, um, someone who may be a mentor, so in a mentorship role, an educational mentorship role, you could use them as well. Okay, so we're going to ask for three letters of recommendations. The only thing we're going to ask is that they are no family or no personal friends. Okay, so for any reason that uh, we see that they might be a family and or a personal friend, we'll get back to you and let you know, hey, unfortunately, this person um, is going to be unacceptable. And so you have the opportunity of, of adding a new one. The way our letter of recommendations work is we, it's an actual form. And so what you do is you'll add your recommender's name and the email address, and then they will be sent um, a link to uh, get to the recommendation form. So it's a grid form, which asks specific questions. So there's kind of check marks. So go ahead and check off the different questions that are being asked. And then there's an option uh, for them to upload a letter as well. Okay, so the one thing that we are gonna be requiring for them is to actually fill out the recommendation form. And then there's an option to actually submit um, an optional letter. Okay. So let's talk about the prerequisites. So we'll, we'll go ahead 
and talk about um, the supplemental um, prerequisites. I think there's a section, it might say supplemental prerequisites, it might say School of Nursing, but there's a section on the application that will list the prerequisites in terms of uh, how to apply to the program. So for the prerequisites, we're gonna ask that you submit a biostatistics course. And so what we're asking is for something that's equivalent to Biostats 100A or Biomathematics 170A. So these two are courses at UCLA. Um, if you do not know what the equivalent is, um, feel free to ask me and or you can go to our website and we have a list of approved uh, prerequisites. Um, do know that biostatistics does have to be completed within the last three years. And then next we have nursing research. So we are asking for a graduate level nursing research course. Um, if you are going to be applying for MSN uh, to PhD, if you are a BS to PhD, then we're going to ask that you complete an undergraduate nursing research course. With our prerequisites, we want those to be completed with the CR better. Uh, and I think there was a question, which I can go back to, because someone was asking if the GRE is required. Yes, the GRE is required. And let me get to the question here. Um, mm -hmm. I am a renewal applicant and I obtained my MSN in 2017. Um, and okay, with the adult juro, acute care, awesome. And P certification, uh, yes. Okay, so there you go. So hopefully I answered that. You do have to take the GRE. And then I think someone else asked, um, oh, okay, good question. So why is the GRE required when undergraduate admissions is no longer uh, requiring the SAT um, and ACT? That is a great question. It's not really a, a, a question I can answer. Um, I just know that UCLA Graduate Division has a requirement for everyone who's applying for doctoral studies to complete the GRE. But with that, um, there's no minimum requirement um, in terms of your score uh, for the GRE that we're looking for. Um, and so there, there is no kind of baseline of what we're looking for. It's just submitting the GRE. They, look, they do look to see how well you do on it. Um, but it's not one of the admission requirements that is weighed heavily in terms of being admitted into the program. But that is a good question. Um, not sure why graduate division is a little bit behind in terms of requiring a uh, interest exam or for undergraduate admissions, it is not required, but good question. All right, and so lastly, we are asking that you do have a RN license. So that can come from the current state that you're in and or if you are applying as an international student, it can come from your home country as well. Okay, so last couple of slides. So again, if we do have any international applicants, we are gonna ask that you take either the TOEFL or the IELTS. Okay, so if you're gonna be having to take the TOEFL exam, we're gonna ask that you score at least 87, or the IELTS is gonna be a seven or higher. If you do need to take it, here's our institution code and our intending graduate uh, major code. Okay. We do have a second round, which is our interview. So what we do is we, we like to, to offer a Zoom 30 minute interview um, for those that have moved on from the first phase to the second phase. And so students will be meeting with um, faculty members. Um, and there's, I believe you'll be meeting with about uh, three to four faculty members um, that come from the student affairs committee and they will uh, provide you with a, uh, no longer than 30 minutes. Um, but, but part of it is just to, to make sure that the focus is, is on your application, discuss a little bit further in terms of what your research interest is. Okay, so that is the second phase. Um, uh, we're gonna make sure that it's on Zoom. Uh, I think our first year we had it where it was in person, but we felt Zoom is the best way to make sure that we can accommodate people from coming, coming from different areas. If you're in another state, another city, or even if you're in another country, okay. And so to finish up, just like we have this disclaimer for all of our programs, we want you to know that um, if we could, we would love to admit all of our uh, applicants into the program. Um, you know, each program is competitive, the same thing is for our doctoral program. And so by coming to today's information session, you're definitely getting a lot of insight on the program, um, but just know that not all admissions is guaranteed. All right, and last but not least, let's go ahead and give you the deadlines to apply to the program. So. Uh, our first deadline is going to be December 1st. So for those that are interested, again, for applying for fall 2022, 
being a one applied by December 1st, which is going to fall on a Monday this year. And we also have a supporting uh, documents um, uh, deadline of January 15th. So for instance, you're going to submit your application by December 1st. And then what we like to do is if you have recommenders um, that are unable to make the December 1st deadline, we're going to give them about another month and a half to submit. So we're going to give them a January 15th deadline. Okay, so that's our cutoff date. Um, also, again, if you are going to have to take the GRE exam, um, you can have that submitted by the January 15th deadline as well. Okay, so um, the processing team um, is going to be myself, uh, Jamie Gama, and Natalie Asensio. So if you like, go ahead and take a screenshot here of our emails. Um, you can ask us any type of questions as you're starting the application process and or if you have any questions about the program, we'll be happy to assist you. And then again, in terms of the uh, official transcripts, you'll have to submit those um, once admitted into the program. So you wouldn't have to worry about that now. But if you want to get a jump start, you can go ahead and take a screenshot of this. If your university is offering electronic transcripts, official transcripts, you can have it sent to my email address. And or if you need it to be sent as a hard copy, you can have the physical address there. OK. So I am running a little bit behind, but the good thing is, Leone, we have a little bit more time on the back end, um, but I do also want to be cognizant of your time as well. So let me just answer a couple of these questions and then we'll get started. Oh, okay. So Lisa, I hope I answered that for you. The GRE results, uh, we're going to ask for the final deadline of January 15th. And yes, GRE does have to be completed within the last five years. Uh, Jonathan is asking, can we complete the biostats course prior to starting the program? Yes, you can. So again, you guys can apply with biostats because that is the one that has a time limit. If it's past the three years, uh, you can still apply um, and you can be admitted to the program. And what we'll do is we'll just have you complete it prior to starting the program in the fall. So yes, you could take it in the spring or summer. Typically students who are admitted to the program will take biostats during the summer. So the summer right before they start in the fall. Okay, um, good question here. So people are asking typically how many people apply and are admitted into the program. Uh, so last year we had about 15, uh, 15 or 16 applications and we admitted 12. And of those 12, we have 11 that, are, that have started with us uh, this fall. So we had one student that actually deferred admissions so uh, that uh, student will be starting with us next fall. It's a great question. Uh, someone's also asking if I'm a registered nurse in my country, so not in the US, uh, should I do more sort of uh, certified exams? No, you do not have to. And do you have to have an R license by the time you apply? Um, no, you do not. Um, so the goal is to make sure that you have your R license before you start the program. So that's another great question. Okay, so one more. Someone's asking, I took the recent nursing research in 2016. Um, by the time they start the program um, in fall 2022, it'll be about six years. But nursing research does not have a time limit. So you don't have to worry about that as long as you took uh, an equivalent nursing research course, you'd be fine. So great questions, guys. Uh, feel free to keep asking those and we'll go ahead and answer them as we continue throughout the information session. Um, but what I wanna do is introduce um, our new Director of Financial Aid, Leonie Thomas, and she's gonna give you some important information in terms of how much the program costs, how can you pay for it, but at the same time, how can we pay for it for you? Uh, so without further ado, take it away, Leonie. Hi, Mark. Thank you so much for the introduction. And hi, Prospective Bruins. Welcome to today's information session. I hope you've learned a lot, and I hope you're excited to apply to our program. So uh, to I hope to answer or ad at least address you know, the big question, how am I going to pay for all of this? So first, I wanted to touch on um, fees that you can expect to pay in this program. So the current uh, in-state fees for, for this year is uh, $13,136 year. Um, that's your tuition and fees. 
um, that are charged by the university. Um, we also have UC SHIP, UC, so that's the university health insurance, which you can purchase for an additional 4,719 per year. Um, health insurance here is mandatory. You may waive the UC SHIP if you can, you know, if you have your own coverage and you can provide proof of that. Um, fees are paid once per quarter. So you basically take the tuition and fees and divide by three. So your quarter cost is about $4,379. Uh, fees are not, uh, not unit-based. Unit so you are assessed like full-time fees. So even if you take less or you take more, uh, you are subject to one flat fee. Uh, you'll see another figure down there. So our total projected budget for a year is $46,600. So that encompasses, you know, your tuition and fees, your health insurance, but it also includes other fees that aren't charged by the university that you do want to be mindful of. So room and board, books and supplies, transportation, etc. So again, these are not, of course, fees that uh, the university charges. We only charge the, um, the current in-state fees that you see above. And uh, what we use the budget for is that's the limit, how much financial aid we can award you per academic year. So you'll see a QR code, feel free to follow the link there to view more cost of attendance information on our website. It'll give you like a specific breakdown of all the components. All right. So before going into types of support, I do want to mention that deadlines are really critical. So. If you are considering to apply for a fellowship, that deadline comes up first. That's December 1st, 2021 this year uh, for fellowship. So you can apply either on your admissions applications or with the graduate division. And March 2nd, 2022 is the priority deadline for uh, the free application for federal student aid, FAFSA. So if you're applying for federal aid, make sure to apply by March 2nd. The application opened up as of October 1st, so it's already available. And same with the California Dream Act. And then around June is usually our scholarship deadline in the School of Nursing, so we'll distribute the applications around May. And slide. Awesome, so some financial aid opportunities at the School of Nursing. So we've mentioned some fellowships. The graduate division deadline is December 1st. Um, you can apply at grad.ucla.edu. And if you've applied for federal financial aid, if you submit your FAFSA, you would be eligible for direct unsubsidized loans and graduate plus loans. And then we also have scholarship money that are based both on merit and need. So there's a few opportunities there. Next, um, more specifically, so a few fellowships I wanted to highlight. Um, we have the university fellowship. So for each entering doctoral student, uh, they will receive you know, a fellowship to cover their full tuition in their first year if they're not covered by another fellowship. So if you're not getting any other aid, we cover your full fees for your first year. I also wanted to highlight the Coda Robles fellowship. So this fellowship, um, this pays your full tuition and fees as well, plus you are eligible for a $25,000 stipend each year. So that's the equivalent of 42,855 in financial aid um, per year. And you receive that for four years at the School of Nursing. And then some other support opportunities are also, uh, you know, you can work at UCLA. So if you're a teaching assistant or a graduate research assistant, the School of Nursing is committed to funding uh, you fully. Um, so 29,212 per year, your fees are paid and you also receive a stipend. Um, one more thing I wanted to mention for UC employees, if you're a UC employee at any UC, so not just UCLA, you may also be eligible for a two-thirds tuition reduction. All right, yeah, so that was kind of an, a brief overview. Um, here's my contact information. As mentioned, my name is Leone. Um, there's my email there. You can also email our general mailbox at financialaid.sonnet.ucla.edu. And the QR code will also take you to our contact page. Um, but if there's any questions, so I saw that Karen asked, do we need to apply for the university fellowship? No. So if you're an admitted PhD student in your first year, you will automatically receive the university fellowship to cover your 
your university fees. Awesome. Sorry, uh, how many years is the fee? Is there a fee? Is this, could you clarify or might yeah. you know, Mark, what he means? Yeah, um, Ari, could you clarify what you mean in terms of like how many year, uh, is the fee? What fee are you talking about? Are you talking about like the tuition in itself? Um, and then are you uh, asking, is there a separate fee for the dissertation? Okay, so she's talking about tuition. Um, so how many years? Okay, so let's back up. And where is it? Here. So, uh, Leonie, if I'm correct, this is per year. That's per year. Yes, the 13136 per year. That's cur the current year. So that's subject to change, of course, in future years. It doesn't fluctuate all too much, but it may be like an additional $100 or so. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's per year. Awesome. And then she has a follow-up question. Thank you for clarifying. Um, so do students still have to pay this tuition when uh, there's no more classes and they're just working on their dissertation? Mm. That's that, a good question. I don't know. That's a that's good a, question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We can follow up it, on you. Yeah, we'll follow up just to be sure because um, I don't think if you're not enrolled in any unit, officially, then I mean, the university doesn't charge tuition. So um, we'll get clarification and follow up with you on the dissertation there. Yeah. So for any reason, if the dissertation is some type, some, if they consider it like a course, then you would have to pay the tuition fee. Uh, so it just depends on what that looks like. But we can also ask Dr. Robbins when she comes back um, in terms of what that looks like. Um, but great question. Um, we have a couple more. Yes, I saw a question about the stipend. Yeah. So um, as a TA, you're appointed at 25%. So the stipend um, monthly, it, it, so you would receive one stipend per month. It's one about $1,300 for a stipend each month. So for nine months. Awesome. And international students can get fellowships if you're admitted. So we have some more flexibility with our School of Nursing funding. So while you wouldn't qualify for any federal financial aid, um, you would be eligible for a university fellowship. So in your first year, you would still receive the full fellowship to cover your fees. And um, we also cover you know, non-resident tuition if, if that's needed. Um, if you're not eligible for AB 540, which covers the non-resident, makes you non-resident tuition exempt. So we do cover that as well in your first year. Awesome. And the deadline. So for the fellowship, for all graduate division fellowships, the deadline is December 1st. That doesn't include our university fellowship. So there's not a, there's not like a formal application process. So that's just a promise to you. When you're admitted as a first year PhD student, we, you automatically receive um, that, that university fellowship, you don't have to apply. But for Coda Robles, for some of the other fellowships that graduate division offers, uh, you do want to make sure to adhere to the deadline December 1st. Does the university fellowship extend beyond one year? Currently, no, we cannot you know, promise that. There will be other funding opportunities. Um, I mean, a lot of students do TA, so your, your tuition is already paid for that way. Um, we do offer, you know, smaller scholarships, but as far as covering all your tuition and fees for the university fellowship, that is limited to one year currently. And that's a great question. Yeah. So there are definitely other ways to make sure that we can pay for your tuition. What is the time commitment for a TA or grad research assistant? Great question. So your appointment is 25%. What does that mean? That's, I, that's eight hours a week is what the time commitment would be for a teaching assistant. So for a TA, you receive, um, I think it's not an hour, hourly wage, it's you receive a monthly stipend. So your tuition and fees are paid and then you receive your um, kind of like your paycheck in the form of a stipend once a month. Two great questions. I know we're about five minutes over for, for you, Leone, so I apologize for keeping you later. Um, 
Oh, we have some more questions. So another question coming in. Yes, is all of the tuition paid as a TA alone? Yes, so most of your fees, I think except for maybe like $50, your fees are remitted. So as a TA, basically your full, um, the student services fee, the tuition fee, your health insurance, um, and like a hundred dollar document fee. So that's, it covers the majority of your tuition. Yeah, each quarter. So you are appointed as a TA quarterly. So depending on the quarters that you do TA, that quarter's tuition will be paid. And then do you connect with professors on your own? We do have, um, you know, Janet in our student services team and she would help you find, um, a position for you, um, match you up with a professor. So if there's anybody in particular you'd work with, you can express that and you might be able to TA for them. Otherwise you can work with Janet in student services to get assigned. Oh yeah. So what we try to do is, is take off a lot of burden on your end. Um, so there's not a lot of work that you'll have to do, you know, besides TA and of course, uh, but trying to mm -hmm. figure out all these other things in terms of how to pay, how to get the TA position and things like that. That's, that's what we're here for. So, yeah. So great questions, everyone. Um, again, let's see, I wanna go to this slide here um, because if you guys did have any other questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to her. Um, and I know she'll be able to answer uh, another question like coming in now. Um, so uh, Jonathan is asking, do you have to work with professors in the PhD program? Mm -hmm. Are you talking about in terms of uh, like the TA? Uh, yeah, as far as the TA, I believe so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think so. I'm not aware of any other assignments. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, within nursing. Yeah, within nursing, you would. Great question. Though. All right. So what we'll do is we have our faculty coming in in about hopefully eight minutes, about 2.15. So um, Leone, feel free to hang in, log off, whatever you like. I, I'm, I'm totally grateful for you taking your time um, out of your day to help answer these questions. But yeah, we're going to spend probably the next few minutes um, answering maybe any additional question you guys have. Uh, you guys can take a stretch break if you like as well, uh, but just hang on for a few more minutes and we'll, we'll get going with the next portion. But we're sure. here, definitely feel free to ask questions if you have any. Yeah, I'll stick around too, if there's any questions. Yeah. You know, one, one thing that I'm thinking about is um, the question about the GRE. Um, how it is required for graduate study, um, but uh, entrance exams um, for undergraduate, right? So if we're thinking SAT or ACT, they're not required for undergraduates. Um, I will bring that up at our next graduate um, meeting that I have to see if there has been any discussions in terms of waiving a GRB for, for doctoral studies or not. I mean, it's a great question. Um, we'll see what the answer is. Uh, for that, but but thank you for bringing that to my attention. That's actually something I didn't think about. Oh, Karen, yes, great question. Um, the writing sample uh, is actually submitted or is actually required, uh, which is also part of the application. So yes, um, you guys will have to submit a, a writing sample. Um, so there is gonna be a section in the application to submit a writing sample. Um, so you can put you know, any, any type of writing sample that you like to put in there. So it is required. Um, and it, what it does is it gives our faculty an idea of your writing style um, and whatever it is, the paper that you chose to write about. So yes, thank you for bringing that up. That is a requirement as well. Another question, uh, is the GRE required for our MSN and P programs? At UCLA, no, it's not. So the GRE is only required um, for doctoral programs. So UCLA, doesn't matter if you're applying for nursing, if you wanna get your doctorate in psychology or whatever the case is, um, graduate division is requiring that all doctoral studies um, have their applicants complete a GRE. 
So not for the master's programs, unless it is uh, specified um, per program. But for us, we don't have it required. Okay, so another question here. Um, if my TOEFL does, if my TOEFL isn't enough to apply to UCLA, uh, what would you recommend? Would you recommend uh, that you can that you continue to apply for it? Um, well, here's the thing: you can. Let's say if you just recently took the TOEFL exam, let's just say, and unfortunately you didn't score the minimum of an 87, um, you can still apply because remember we have our January 15th deadline. Um, so again, I would recommend, and if you haven't taken it, I recommend taking it um, as soon as possible. Uh, that way you can see what your score is. And if for any reason you didn't meet that score, then you could take it again and make sure you meet our January 15th deadline. So I would definitely still encourage you to apply. The goal is just to make sure that you can score that minimum before the January 15th deadline. Okay, and I, okay. All right, and I, I see you said that for computer science, they had it waived. I'm assuming you think the GRE was waived um, for computer science. Okay. Um, what I'll do as well is I'll, I'll have this discussion go a little bit further or I'll bring it up um, the next time um, I have a graduate meeting, um, but I can also bring up this question for our next uh, student affairs committee um, to, to see how they feel about the GRE. But, I know for sure it hasn't been any discussions in terms of it not being a requirement. Um, and do we require any type of GRE prep books? Um, there's no specific books uh, that are required for the prep books, um, but I think you know the typical you know, GRE prep books would be fine. Um, I don't think you guys should have too, way too heavily or think that the GRE is way too heavily in terms of the admissions. Um, it is, of course, something that they'll look at, but it's not end all be all. There's too many moving parts. The, the application uh, review process is too holistic for us to, to weigh one part of it um, more heavier than the other. Okay. So that's a good question. Um, in terms of writing samples, uh, people can use um, you know, maybe thesis, things that they've wrote. Uh, people can also put um, uh, any other type of maybe articles that they've helped write, uh, anything that could be research related. Uh, so writing samples come in all different forms. Um, but I would say for the writing sample, have it be something that you feel is creative, um, that expresses you know, your writing ability and also your interests uh, within nursing and or even nursing research science. So that's a good question. Okay, some great questions here. So we got a couple more minutes and I see Dr. Robbins is back, so that's awesome. And so we'll just wait for the rest of our faculty to hopefully join us. Did you guys have any other lingering questions for the next couple of minutes? Oh, uh, Dr. Robbins, I actually, I, I remembered a question um, that was asked. Um, it had to do with uh, a student asking about tuition. Um, if the student had to pay tuition after the first couple of years, so as they move forward towards the, just towards the dissertation, um, are those still considered units? Um, because if so, then I'm assuming that we would still have to pay for tuition when they're just focusing on the dissertation part. So how does that work in terms of, yeah, like their, their curriculum? Yeah, so um, once you finish your basic coursework and take uh, electives and um, cognates, you register with your dissertation chair or advisor um, for, um, units research units so yes it still requires registration awesome thank you but remember there's ta ta is an opportunity so we can so you know help pay that for you but thank you for clarifying that all right 
we're just going to hang on a couple more minutes. Uh, Leone, just wanted to say thank you. Don't feel, yeah, don't feel as if you have to hang on anymore. But on behalf of me, I, I know those that are that have joined us today. Uh, thank you for again taking the time out of your day to give us some great insight. So thank my you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Of course. See you. Have a great rest of the session. Thank you. All right, we're going to hang on a couple more, a couple more minutes. And hoping everyone is doing well so far. If you like, take a super quick stretch break, uh, grab some water, uh, whatever you need, because we're going to spend the next, what, 35, maybe 40 minutes uh, going over our faculty research panel. I'm going to get a quick sip of water and then we'll go ahead and get started and hopefully uh, the rest of the panelists will join us. Okay. So we do have three faculty here and I wanna be again cognizant of their time. So let's go ahead and move forward uh, with the information session. And um, to me, I think this is probably the most important part of the info session is because at this point, you guys are gonna be able to hear uh, from our different faculty members in terms of their research interests, how they got to it, um, and hopefully also here to answer any questions that you guys have. And so um, what I've been kind of doing for today's session is kind of having like a theme in terms of how did I get uh, how did I get on this path towards research, and so what I wanted to do was have you guys think about that, uh, and if you guys can give a, a little brief explanation in terms of how you got even into nursing and then into nursing research, and then talk about your research interests, uh, that'd be great. And then hopefully we can have a little bit of conversation with our participants from there. Um, so let's I'm just going to go from my order from what I see going down below me. So if that's okay, we'll go ahead and start off with Dr. Robbins. Oh, and then if you can also talk about um, not only research interests, but if you're um, teaching any programs or just currently what you're doing. So that way oh. our participants have an idea of who you are. Okay. Um, so uh, again, I'll say hi, welcome. I, I got to say welcome at the beginning. Um, so thank you for asking us about how we got started with our research. Um, well, let me say that my research focuses on work and health and um, particularly male reproductive health and fertility that's affected by a man's work. Um, and it started because when I was a PhD student at Berkeley, uh, there was this dibromochloropropane um, aftermath, and that is a nematicide that's used on fruit trees. And it turns out that the, there's there was a manufacturing plant in California where they made this substance, DBCP, and it just happened at a, a softball game, families from the plant playing, and they realized that most of them were um, being challenged with fertility. And it turns out that this is a male reproductive toxicant. So that's how I got started in my area of research, uh, looking at um, work and how that affects, uh, could affect male fertility. Um, and I've been doing that um, ever since I graduated as a PhD student. I have a lab in the School of Nursing on the sixth floor. We look at all kinds of uh, DNA damage, um, um, and also now more recently, what's good for male fertility. And so we look at how sperm respond to diet and exercise and things like that. So um, that's my program of research. Stress is a big part of it as well. And um, so we look at uh, stress and uh, male fertility and um, yeah, so that's it. Thank you. 
Awesome, thank you. And then right below you, I have Dr. Kristen Choi. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. And I'm looking forward to uh, speaking with you all and hearing your questions. So um, my path into research and nursing research is maybe a bit more non-traditional. I started nursing school uh, at the University of Michigan and I didn't really know very much about nursing when I joined. I actually spent most of my life wanting to go to art school, but then kind of felt like I like science and math and, and just decided really kind of on a whim to go into nursing school. I, uh, I think a lot of people go into nursing because they have a personal connection or a passion. And I really didn't have that. I just thought I wanted to do something related to science and people and nursing seemed great. So when I got into nursing school and started practicing in clinicals as a nursing student, I, I realized right away that I had um, a lot of concerns about nursing practice and the role of nurses in hospitals. I loved the patient care and getting to work with patients and families, but I often felt really frustrated by the constraints and role that I saw nurses playing in healthcare and really frustrated by the system issues that I saw in healthcare. And I found myself just constantly wondering, you know, why are these patients so sick? Why are they here over and over again? Why is it that nurses practice this way and doctors practice this way and we don't work together? And really found myself so focused on those upstream issues in health that I, uh, I got really frustrated with the, the individual clinical care role. I kind of came to feel like as a clinical nurse, and this was as a nursing student, so probably not fully informed, I felt like I was just kind of a cog in this machine of healthcare, and I couldn't do anything to fix that machine in the ways I really wanted to. So around the same time when I was really uh, rethinking my relationship to nursing, I had the opportunity to join a, a BSN to PhD program and to get involved in doing some nursing research. When I got started in research, I loved it. I felt like it really allowed me to go upstream and do the kind of work that would make uh, allow me to make the change I wanted to make. And I went straight into a PhD program after that. Uh, I do research now on mental health services and systems for kids. Uh, very interested in how we can use research to inform policy and practice and, and really how we can design systems to be better. And uh, despite my early experiences feeling frustrated with nursing practice, I've over time realized that there, there really needs to be a strong relationship between research and practice so that what we as nurse scientists are doing can really actually change things on the ground for practicing nurses and, and for patients. So uh, that's a bit about my background. Um, some of the studies I'm doing right now are focused on uh, adverse childhood experiences, how uh, early life trauma and adversity affects health across the life course and how we as healthcare providers can provide care in a way that is trauma informed. I am doing some work on homelessness and schizophrenia in Los Angeles and uh, looking at some of the system constraints we have here locally on getting people into supportive housing. And then I'm also doing a project looking at uh, California's state insurance policies related to autism and developmental disabilities and how those policies actually allow families to access care and whether it uh, does anything to make their lives better. So uh, that's a bit about me and my work uh, and uh, we'll look forward to taking questions during the Q&A. Awesome. Thank you for that. And the next we have Dr. Holly Devon. Thanks, Mark. And good afternoon, everybody. It's so nice to be with all of you. So this will be interesting because my path is um, quite different from Dr. Choi's. So um, actually, I started out as a candy striper when I was a freshman in high school, because one day my mom said, oh, I see that they're looking for candy stripers at the local hospital. I think you would be really good at that. So why don't you apply? And I'm like, well, OK, sounds interesting. And so that was the beginning of my love affair with nursing. And then when I turned 16, I took the nursing assistant classes and then started working as a nursing assistant. So my mom got me into the field. And then by the time I was a senior in high school, she's saying, well, I think you should go to medical school. And I'm like, um, you know, the great thing about nursing is you get to be with the patients 24 seven, right? It's, it, it's not about cure, it's about care. And I really love doing that. Um, so I was very fortunate to go into a baccalaureate program that, with uh, admission in freshman year. So I had a, a very nice collegiate experience um, as well as uh, becoming a nurse. And in my senior year, I did a rotation in the CCU. I got to choose 
And I loved it in there. And I wanted to work in the ICU so bad that when I started applying for jobs as a new grad, I talked my way into the ICU. And I re still remember my interview with the um, Associate Director of Nursing. And I said, I'll do anything you ask me to if you just let me work in the ICU. I'll, I'll take CCRN courses. Uh, I'll do anything. I'll get a master's degree, but um, just don't make me work in med search. <laughs> and so she'd let me work in the ICU. And of course, I started out on nights. So I, I learned a lot because the um, older nurses, the more senior nurses were happy to let me do most of the work. Um, but when I was an undergrad, my professors were telling me, you should really go to graduate school. But I was like, okay, I really wanted to be a clinical nurse. So I applied to the master's program for, to be a cardiovascular clinical specialist. And, but the program I entered was a research-based, it was a master of science degree, um, not an MSN. It was a master of science in nursing science. And so I did research and like Dr. Choi, they, uh, Choi though, I fell in love with it. And my, I had a fantastic mentor and she said, just stay on in the PhD program. And I said, oh no, I can't do that. I've got to, I came into the program with a new baby. So um, every year for 15 years, she was like, when are you going to apply to the PhD program? So finally I went into the PhD program and I was always interested in sex differences as a clinical nurse. I saw so many differences between my female and male patients, especially sending them to the cath lab. And, and invariably the men came back positive and many of the females came back negative. And I was wondering why, what are we doing wrong? Are we sending patients there that, that shouldn't be going? because it's an invasive procedure, even though it's low risk, or was there something unique about them? So when I was starting to work on my dissertation, I, I focused on um, symptoms of MI, and I looked at sex differences and designed a conceptual model um, based on anatomical, physiological, um, and psychological differences between the sexes. So that was, that's how I've spent most of my research career, doing some iteration of sex differences in symptoms or um, treatment seeking behavior. But in the last few years, um, in 2018, I went to Rwanda on a Fulbright Fellowship and their main health issues are mental health, HIV and maternal child health. So I had to figure out how to meld cardiovascular disease. And um, now that their HIV is being treated as a chronic condition, uh, there is a lot more incidence of uh, non-communicable diseases. So I did a pilot study on cardiovascular risk in patients with and without HIV. And um, recently I did a pilot study of acupuncture for angina because we found in our prior studies that up to 30% of patients who are on guideline-directed therapy still have symptoms even after MI, um, heart attack. And uh, so I have a large-scale clinical trial that'll be reviewed October 21st. And then I'm working on a new grant um, to do further work in Rwanda. So, it's an exciting time and we're really focusing on symptom management right now. So I look forward to your questions as well. Thank you, Mark. Awesome, thank you. I think it's great because I get to hear new things about you guys as well that I didn't know before. So thank you for that. So let's go ahead and open up the Q&A um, for our participants here. And all right, oh, okay, we got a, got a long one here, okay. Um, so Lillian is saying, I am an FMP, but I started my own cannabis company two years ago. Upon entering the industry, I noticed uh, that there are no health regulations in the cannabis industry in regards to manufacturing uh, vapes, edibles, and other, uh, oh, in, even oh, cultivation. I wanted to study the health effects of the industry in relation to public health. My interest is not strictly nursing related. How would I allow, or would I be allowed 
to do uh, research nursing in this area. Would any of the viable be connected to uh, Via? Zia? Sorry, I don't know what that is. Cooper, uh, PhD. I know UCLA got about 6.5 million in funding for cannabis research, and I want to be a part of this, but I'm not sure if the PhD in nursing is the right route. Um, would there be another PhD that I should be getting? So sorry, that was a little long-winded, but I know you guys could see that in there as well. Maybe Dr. Robbins wants to start? Sure, uh, I can. Um, so I'm uh, refresh what I heard. Um, the beginning was you started your own- Cannabis industry, uh, yes. Um, and that uh, they wanted to study health effects in the industry related to public health, but mm -hmm. it's not strictly nursing related. Um, and so sh she knows that uh, that UCLA got a big funding, which is 6.5 million. Yes. And cannabis yeah. research but just doesn't know if nursing is the right role for, for this type of research. Yes. Well, um, um, okay. So if you're looking at the industry and looking at it from that aspect, um, yes, uh, we have a number of people in the School of Nursing who look at work and health and um, so as a nurse, that, that, is, that fits well with us. Um, if you're looking at it in terms of the um, public health effects, also that's very important to nursing. We know that people who are um, using products for pain medication um, are, are in the community. And so that also fits with nursing. Um, so I, I would say absolutely, it, it would fit with nursing and the research that's going on here right now is um, uh, a good fit for you. Um, and, and yeah. I, yeah, and I, I would I would add to what you said, Wendy. You know, Lillian, I I absolutely think this is an important area to study. And you know, I think when I did my PhD, I did research on PTSD and trauma. And a lot of people told me, uh, I don't know if that's really nursing. What's the connection to nursing? The the relationship to nursing? And you know, I, I think it's uh, for for any number of topics that might not fit traditionally in nursing the way we think of it in hospitals. I think it's it's very easy to see how it relates to people and their health and is going to touch nursing practice. There's also a really growing emphasis on nursing scientists doing research that has implications for policy. So I, I think that this topic is related to nursing and public health. And even if it doesn't have a, a very direct connection to how nurses practice or how nurses might intervene with patients, it doesn't mean it doesn't have implications for nursing. And I think this absolutely does. I also think that, you know, today there's such an emphasis on team science. And I think me and probably others on this panel too, uh, my, my committee and the people that I worked with were not all nurses. I had people in psychology and medicine and all different kinds of folks. And I think the beauty of UCLA is that it's a very interdisciplinary place. And if you were to um, you know, think about a topic like this, uh, I think it's only a strength to think about who outside of nursing could you partner with uh, to study something like this. Yeah, I actually was gonna add that piece about the thing to consider is you may have one primary mentor and it might be your dissertation chair, but you're gonna have a whole team of mentors with different areas of expertise when you're in the program. And most certainly we would encourage and facilitate having mentors outside of the School of Nursing um, or outside of UCLA. I, I see that Lillian asked if somebody could connect her to Dr. Cooper who, I assume must be tied to this cannabis grant, which is a great, great idea, is to talk to people. Um, we try to match faculty interests to student interests, um, but there's more to mentoring than just that one match. So I think that um, even though you have public health interests, plus Dr. Robbins is an expert in that as well, so we have a lot of overlapping expertise in nursing and public health and other areas. So I, I just see it as a strength. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, another question came in from Shaylin. 
Uh, she has an interest, uh, research interest that addresses high health disparities in Native American, in the Native American population. Uh, but the only research experience that she was able to procure is pathology, uh, which is the second area of interest. Um, and I believe she was saying that another smaller university had some reservation um, with the little options for research mentors. And so I think to finish off with that question is, do we have someone that may have something that's similar to this research interest that she has? Absolutely. Um, uh, we, we have uh, had a number of grants in the School of Nursing over the years where uh, the research has been done by um, uh, 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 PIs who are from reservation, re uh, Indian reservations and um, are interested in this topic. There is a center that exists in the School of Nursing that looks at um, Native American populations and health. Uh, so I would say that we are well situated um, for your interest. Um, Dr. Felicia Hodge uh, funded um, many times NIH funding uh, to look at um, and address health disparities in Native Americans. Um, and uh, we have a new assistant professor also, uh, Christine Samuel Nakamura. Uh, who looks at um, subsistence farming on reservations. And um, so th this, yes, you'd be well situated here. And I, I think it looks to me like Shaylin's comment also asked about her, her background doing pathology research and less, you know, in the specific area of disparities. And, you know, Shaylin, I think that's totally okay. A lot of students, you know, when they are doing their nursing degree, might have research experience in a lab or something in basic science. And it's fairly common, I think, for that to be people's first research experience. And so, you know, um, the, the great thing about research, whether you're doing basic science or you're doing something on disparities in population health, is that we are using at a high level the same process for doing science in both of these areas. And so I think that, you know, you'll, you'll still come in knowing some, some things about the process of research, even if the topic and methods are going to be really different. And, uh, you know, I, I think that that's not something that uh, would hold you back, you know, from wanting to get into this area. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, let's move on. Uh, Ari has a question. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how you work with students? Um, basically, how do you work with students uh, being a faculty advisor? Yeah, this is a great question. Every student should ask this question, uh, especially after they're admitted and they start working with faculty. So it's, it's very important to get on the job training when you're in the program, not just coursework. So for the way I work with students is um, I expect them to submit for grant funding and I expect them to submit their papers um, for publication. And so that's kind of like a contract between us. And I support them very well to, to, to achieve those aims by connecting them with other um, mentors. Uh, I had a postdoc last year who came in right before the start of the pandemic. And, it, and it's not very different from being a pre-doc. And she wanted to expand her research into the microbiome along with patients uh, with uh, heart disease. And we searched a lot and we got one referral after another and ended up with just a wonderful partner in medicine who's an expert, an internationally known expert in the microbiome. So um, I am a firm believer in setting goals and uh, with, with timelines. And so that usually results are very good when you're purposefully planning outcomes. Thank you for that. And next question we have here. Um, Karen has an interest in chronic illness and palliative care, and is wondering if we have any faculty that are looking at this specific issue as well. Well, we have several 
cancer researchers. So, um, Wendy, what about um, Dr. Song? Mm -hmm. Well, no, she, and she's doing. Uh, Young Su is. Um, yeah. Yeah, she does um, Alzheimer's and dementia and sleep. Uh, and um, we have a number of uh, researchers in in the area of dementia and and Alzheimer's. And then yeah, for chronic disease, my goodness, we have a lot of them. I mean, we have cardiovascular disease, we have different cancers, we have HIV. I'm not sure, Karen, if she's interested in a specific chronic illness, but we do have a lot of um, people doing uh, research into various chronic illnesses. I, I also would say, I know there's a couple of questions in the chat related to, you know, faculty match with my interests. And I am, um, I think it's, it's important to kind of think of your interests that there's multiple parts to it and that there right. may not be an exact mentor that matches every single part of everything that you want to do, but that's okay. And that's pretty normal. I think you want to look for somebody who has overlap in content in at least one area, uh, but it may not be every single part of what you want to do. And again, the beauty of doing a PhD at a place like UCLA is that ultimately you'll be supported by a team of mentors and a committee that can come from outside the school of nursing and where you can bring together the right people with the right expertise. It's it's rare that uh, at any school of nursing or really anywhere you find one person that has it all. So I, I wouldn't uh, worry too much about finding somebody that has everything that you're looking for. Thank you for that, Dr. Choi. Um, okay, we have another question here. Does UCLA help with job opportunities upon graduation from the PhD program? <laughs> I'm laughing because all of you are in such a good position, way different than when me and Dr. Robbins came, came into academia, I think. You, you won't even need much assistance with the job hunt. Yeah, and there, the, when you are a student, um, we do encourage you to uh, present your um, dissertation work at um, meetings where you will meet people, and we attend those meetings and we introduce you, and um, we also have colleagues across the country, and we reach out to them about you. Uh, so yes, definitely, um, we do. The one thing I would add is if you're interested in a faculty position, you, you will be encouraged to seek a postdoc opportunity. That will really put you in the driver's seat for um, having access to um, a number of job options. All right, thank you. And Jonathan, we'll get to your question, but I see another small one here. Um, Ari is asking, can you tell us some other professional roles besides faculty that graduates have gone into? Sure. Um, our graduates take positions uh, in, in um, uh, research. Uh, for example, ISAP is, is uh, a large group of researchers who work together looking at addiction. And so we have um, had people who were interested in that area and loved research and were hired to do that. That happens frequently. We have um, graduates who go into government uh, and take positions in, in um, uh, related to policy and government. Um, health systems. Health systems, absolutely. Um, so yes, number of different areas. All right. And so Jonathan is actually asking a good question. He's yeah. saying from a, a business perspective, um, have you had your interests been influenced by funding and what the intentions are um, for who will fund your research? And so his interest is healthcare bullying. Um, and he wants to know how he could do a better job in healthcare preventing um, bullying, so meaning like from nursing to nurse, uh, from nursing to nursing, or MD to nursing, surgeon to NP, um, and so forth. So I think this is a really good question, Jonathan, and I would say yes, uh, interests are influenced to a degree by funding, but I think 
one of the maybe underappreciated skills of, of being a scientist is how much uh, creativity goes into the role. And one thing that you will definitely learn during your PhD is how to be creative and thinking about how do you frame the interest that you have for funding priorities that are out there. Um, I think sometimes funding opportunities may come up that are a good opportunity that kind of pull you in a different direction or maybe expand the direction that you're already going. But I, I think that, you know, the topic that you're talking about is certainly one that is important and fundable. And if it doesn't appear that there are funding opportunities out there that fund this exact thing, um, a lot of that may be an issue of framing and how do you frame this question for what's out there and, and make the case that there's a match. So creativity is something you will learn in the program when it comes to making those connections. And, and I definitely think this is a very important and fundable area of research. I know many investigators uh, who have very large grants studying things like uh, burnout in the nursing workforce and looking to quantify those things economically, as well as looking at how they influence um, patient outcomes. I agree with that mostly. I would say that, for example, NIH is focused on the nation's health and health of individuals and populations. So they're less likely to be um, interested in an issue like this, which is really professional, but I agree, I would never be deterred from applying for something because I can write to the specific call or I will search for the agency that is interested in funding these topics. All agencies have a strategic plan and priorities for funding. So that's easily researchable. So I, I've never been deterred uh, from my doing my research. Uh, but you know, every now and then I've thought, well, you know, it would have been good to be an infectious disease, for example, in the last two years. <laughs> but still, um, you know, I mentioned that when I went to Rwanda, I had to figure out a way that I could do cardiovascular research, even though it wasn't a top priority there. So I think just about anything is possible. Awesome, and I'll answer Lisa's question. Uh, she's asking, so the letter of recommendations come from a mentor slash colleague not affiliated with UCLA. I have a mentor who works at UCLA. So yes, you could use people not affiliated with UCLA or people that work at UCLA. So that, that's totally fine. But that's a good question. Get the people who can speak to your success because the, the committee is going to want to know um, that you have the ability to be successful and getting strong letters of recommendation, no matter where they come from is what matters. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bond. Um, which professors are working on burnout? Do we have any professors working on burnout? Absolutely, we do. Um, the we are um, one of 17 um, university schools of nursing funded by NIOSH, National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. And this is an area, a priority area for NIOSH, CDC NIOSH. We have a training grant. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jian Li uh, is very well known for his research um, on uh, workplace stressors, workplace stress burnout. Um, uh, and um, so, yes, we do. And we have funding for students. We have training funds for students in this area. Awesome. So we have a couple more minutes because I see we have one of our students coming in for the student panel. Um, but uh, Jonathan has another question. Um, basically pertaining to um, post postdoctoral uh, studies, and so uh, let me let me move forward. He was a TA uh, his time as a master, is working with Dr. Uh, Bush as well as Dr. Galinsky. Uh, Kristen, you want to talk about NCSP and and Wendy and I could address other options. Sure. So, so briefly, um, uh, doing a, a postdoctoral fellowship, I think is a great idea. Uh, I, when I was a PhD student, I didn't even know postdoctoral fellowships were a thing until I was like 75% of the way through. And then people told me I should do a postdoc. And I was like, oh, what's that? But basically when you do a PhD, um, you know, you will learn the process of doing research and you'll really focus on one project doing research. But to really be a successful scientist, whether you're going to be a faculty member or a scientist, uh, a nurse scientist somewhere else, 
uh, it, it takes a lot of skills and it really takes a network of people to be in a place where you're able to function independently. And often when you first finish your PhD, you need a little bit more research experience before you can get to that point. A postdoctoral fellowship is usually about a two year period that gives you 100% dedicated time to just building up your research, to getting your work out there, to building up your network and to getting your studies going so that when you do start a position as either a faculty member or a scientist in some other way, you're ready to hit the ground running and your research is in a really strong position. Uh, most top universities and schools of nursing require a postdoctoral fellowship for them to consider you for a faculty job nowadays. Uh, so it's a great option uh, here at UCLA. We have a really wonderful interprofessional postdoctoral fellowship called the National Clinician Scholars Program. Uh, and it allows nurses who've just finished a PhD or a DNP and physicians who are just coming out of their residency to train together and learning how to do health services and policy research. Uh, it's a great option. And there are numerous other postdoctoral fellowships as well that, that you can consider. So that's definitely something that will be addressed uh, if you do uh, come to UCLA for the PhD program and, and you'll learn about options and how to apply for those. Yeah, NIH has a specific option uh, T, a T32, T stands for training, training grants. A T32 funds pre-docs and post-docs. And um, there's probably about 20 that are funded nationally by National Institute for Nursing Research, but they're funded by all the institutes and, and there's a variety of other mechanisms. So they are um, topically focused. So when you're getting ready to graduate or the year before and you want to explore postdocs, um, you'll be able to search to see um, what areas of interest uh, you may be able to get funded for. And there's also an individual mechanism. NIH funds individual um, postdocs under the F32 mechanism. Thank you. So let's go ahead and close this out with one last question. I think this is a really good one that Mimi is asking. Uh, how is UCLA School of Nursing uh, incorporating anti-racism curriculum into the PhD program? And how would they continue to expand and explore this very, uh, this very critical need? So Mimi, I think this is a really great question. And, you know, I, I think that uh, this is something that a lot of programs and uh, schools at UCLA have been working really hard to put an increased emphasis on anti-racism in, in their programs all over the place. So I, I do know that in our PhD program, there's a whole class on uh, theory and philosophy, philosophy and frameworks for use in nursing research. And uh, definitely one of the ones that is covered is structural racism and how we think about racism and anti-racism in the theories and how we approach research. Um, and we're really fortunate at UCLA to have people like Chandra Ford, uh, as well as Kimberly Crenshaw, who were some of the foundational people who developed uh, critical race theory and cl critical race praxis. And so um, I, I think you'll find that that's something that's, uh, that's uh, important at UCLA and is a growing part of what's emphasized in the curriculum. Wendy, uh, you can mention if there's anything else specific that I missed. But um, like I said, there's significant efforts all across UCLA to make sure that this is part of uh, our curriculum across all of our programs. Yes, and in our strategic planning, this is a pillar in our strategic planning for the School of Nursing and, and the curricula are all um, uh, being carefully, uh, we're looking at them and carefully considering. Yeah, I, I, have, I have the content in, in my philosophy of science class and I have it in ethics as well. So. I think most of the faculty are trying really hard to see that it just gets integrated throughout the curriculum. Thank you for that. Um, and I also wanna say thank you uh, to the three of you for taking time out of your day. Um, I know I really appreciate it. And I also know the participants do as well. I thought this has been a great conversation. Um, and so again, I wanna thank you know, Dr. Robbins, Dr. Joy and Dr. Devon for taking time out of your day. So I appreciate My it. My pleasure. Have a good day, everyone. It's a pleasure. Thank you. All right. So let's go ahead and move on to the last portion um, of our information session. Um, again, I've been thanking so many people, but I want to thank especially these three people here that are, that are joining us. Um, we have our current uh, doctoral PhD program. So um, you guys heard from our faculty, so now you get to hear from our current students. Um, and so uh, what I've been doing is we've been keeping on a theme. 
um, which is how did I get on this path uh, to research? How did I get on this path to becoming a nurse and then all of a sudden get into nursing research? Um, so if you guys can start off, um, I guess saying who you are uh, and then again, how we got on this path. So we'll start there and then we'll go ahead and open it up for some Q and A uh, to our participants. Um, so who I see from below me is gonna be Yuri. So we'll start with you and then we'll go ahead and move on down. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Yuri Komatsuo. I go by Yuri. I'm a first year PhD student, meaning I just started like a couple weeks ago. So about a year ago, oh, thank you, Mark. <laughs> about a year ago, I was in, you guys, you know, see it. I was at the information session. So nothing is actually my second career. I was in business first, but I always interested in medicine, especially actually nursing. Um, so I'm originally from Japan. Um, my job brought me to the United States quite a while ago. Um, then I actually learned in this country, I can go back to school anytime. And then I, I love my previous job in business, but I really wanted to um, like work in more like a direct way with many different people. So I just decided to switch my career to nursing. Uh, went back to the accelerated BSN program, did the master, and then I actually became a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. Um, the reason is I actually really wanted to work with the individuals with the intellectual disabilities, and I really wanted to help them in their behavioral mental health need. Um, then while I was practicing, I realized the, this specific population is very under-researched. And then that was the beginning of uh, my journey to the PhD program and then starting the PhD. So instead of looking for research, I decided I want to do it by myself. And then, um, you know, long story short, I was accepted by the UCLA and then I'm here now. Awesome. And really fast, how, are, how did the, I think we might be on week three. I always lose track, but, but how are the first two weeks going for you? It was, well, um, <laughs> I'm still adjusting. Mm -hmm. So I'm new to UCLA and LA. So I moved to LA less than a month ago. Um, so I really did not know how things work here or even where the grocery store is while I actually needed to figure out how to get to school as well. So, well, I'm still adjusting, but I, I, I'm really fortunate. I have great classmates and then, um, you know, all faculties are really helpful. So I'm surviving. So I think that's where I am still. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, sometimes it's survival mode for a little bit <laughs> until it gets better. So awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And so below you, I have Kirsten. Thank you, Mark. Um, thank you, Yuri. Uh, I'm Kirsten Buen. I'm a third year student um, in the PhD program here at the School of Nursing. And um, my background is in oncology, cancer care, and also palliative care. Um, how I came to the PhD program, <laughs> I had no intention of ever pursuing a PhD, <laughs> to be honest. I think it, the path found me uh, because I, you know, experiencing a lot of distress at the bedside as a nurse and also in my work in palliative care just forced me to confront a lot of questions that, you know, I needed to grapple with. You know, what's going on in the system that is generating such distress for myself and my colleagues. Um, you know, what are the factors that contribute to our wellness? Um, I was really drawn to clinician wellness and um, constructs like moral distress and burnout really through the lived experience of my work. And so I, you know, I was working for, you know, many years. I think this is probably my 12th years in nurse and in nursing and I was like, I need to answer these questions in some way that is rigorous um, because I am identifying gaps in the literature and, you know, and, and how do I go about answering them? I don't have the training, so I need to go and get the training. And so um, that was sort of my foray into the world of, 
of sort of a PhD in nursing. It, it wasn't really a plan. It was sort of more compelled by the by the questions. So, um, so yeah, now I'm a third year. Um, I'm my sort of program of research, sort of my research program interests are, are broadly around palliative care complexity and per, with particular attention to sort of the structural factors that um, make up that complexity. But my dissertation will center on the lived experience of clinicians and how their interactions with the system sort of help get at the question of what constitutes complexity in palliative care. And the hope is that, you know, if we can harness these kinds of really abstract constructs, um, you know, in tools or some sort of measurement that that can be used to track, you know, um, relationships with other, with other things such as, um, let's say, burnout or um, other outcomes that might be important. So, um, I don't know if that <laughs> answers oh, the questions, Mark. But, yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. And mm -hmm. then next, last but not least, uh, Sharice. Hi, everyone. Um, good to see you guys. Hi, Yuri. Hi, Kirsten. Hi, Mark. Thanks for having me. Um, so my name is Sharice Watts, and I'm also a third year student. Um, I'm on the entry level master's track of the program. So that means I started the program fresh out of nursing school. I got my master's at Charles Drew University. And I also, like Kirsten, um, didn't really think I would pursue the PhD route and research. But um, in my um, second year of nursing school, I had a mentor who started kind of introducing us to what the PhD can do for you as a nurse and how much um, change you can really make with having a PhD. I mean, it allows you to work to make change on a broader scale. And I thought that was really important. So um, my school has a bridge to the PhD. And so I um, applied to that program and I made it into UCLA. So the journey has been really nice thus far. I've enjoyed it. Um, and currently working on my research proposal chapters. And so my research interest is all about um, Black and Latinx parents of children with developmental disabilities and intellectual disabilities who reside in medically underserved and low-income um, communities. And so research shows that these families, these children, do not get screened for developmental delays and disabilities at, this, at the same rate as some other children, their peers. And so um, that really leads to um, really severe outcomes in progression of the disability. So I really want to speak to these parents to kind of better understand the role of systemic racism in this disparity, um, barriers and facilitators, and just how social determinants of health influence what's going on in their life. So yeah, I'm really excited. Um, third year's been off to a good start, just working on my chapters and, and working. I also work as a graduate student researcher for my advisor, and that's been a really great experience. So if, if you guys have any questions about that, I'm happy to answer. Awesome. Thank you for bringing that up. There was uh, some questions uh, when Leone joined us, um, our director of financial aid about, yeah, TA and things like that. And so um, for the participants, for the attendees, you guys are you here. Uh, we have these three wonderful ladies. And so if you guys have any questions, uh, please feel free to put it in the Q&A. OK. So we have one here. Uh, Jonathan is saying, thank you all for sharing your stories. Uh, but Yuri, are you still able to work as an NP being in the program? So that's the first part. Um, and then for Sharice, he says, I met a PhD student when I was TN in 2016, uh, when I was able to attend my master's. Um, oh, okay. Do you know? Uh, um, uh, Solowit, who was also part of Drew. Um, I know who she is, but I, I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah, I never, I never got the chance to meet her, but I've heard her name and I've learned a little bit about her work just from my mentors and like when they were sharing work from other students with us. Awesome. Um, so, so Yuri, um, are you still working basically while being in the program? That's basically what he's asking. I well, I am not working only because uh, of the relocation. I was in a, I was on the East Coast and then moved here 
So I, and then I was working in a community um, mental health services. So I actually could not continue working. Um, but my friend, I mean, some of my cohorts are also in a piece and then some of them are working as a part-time. I think one person is working once a week and the other ones are working actually 20 hours. I don't really know how she divides those hours into the days, but she works 20 hours. Uh, that's only I know among 10 of us. And I think only four of us are, no, five of us, five of us are in a piece and then two are working uh, as a part-time. Yeah, and what about um, the rest of you? Are you guys working at all? Do you know if any other classmates are working that are in your cohort? We do have classmates that are working both, um, I think both per diem and also full time. So it's possible, it's definitely possible. As for me, um, I'm thinking of starting to do like per diem work, but I haven't yet um, pursued it, but it's something that I'm planning to do. And did you guys work your first two years or, or, or not? Because from what I've been told or what I hear is that, you know, the first two years are probably the most grueling of it, right? And so you should really, you know, dedicate your studies, obviously, to that. But did either of you work? Or I know you're always talking about some people that have worked. So I guess, what was it like for you guys? Um, I didn't, um, not clinically. Um, and that was, you know, that was a decision that my family and I made together. And it was definitely a privilege to be able to do that. Um, I, I, I do work as a teaching assistant, so 10 hours per week, and I have almost every quarter of this program except for the first year. Um, but yeah, for the first two years, I, I wasn't working in a clinical capacity. Mm -hmm. It was, I mean, I think you're right, Mark. It, the reality was the, the coursework was very, um, it was sort of all consuming, both in time and also just um, of thought, I think, you know, sometimes we, we forget how much sort of brain power, you know, it requires just to tackle these courses. Um, so. Awesome. And so Lisa has a question. Uh, how many hours a week are you working outside of the program? And what kind of writing examples did you submit? Oh, a two, twofold question. So the writing example would be what which is part of the application. Um, so if you guys could talk about what type of writing example you guys submitted. And then um, how many hours a week are you guys working, thinking about working and or your classmates? How many hours do you think they worked? Let's see. Um, so as for the writing sample, I think I submitted a paper that I wrote in my med search um, master's in nursing class. And it was, I can't remember the title exactly, but it had something to do with endometriosis. So it was like a little research paper. That was the sample that I submitted. And um, as for right now, I'm working 10 hours as a student researcher, but I have done um, up to 20 hours working both as a student researcher and as a TA as well. And, and that was doable because I had very understanding faculty. And so really fast, Sharice, so Jonathan was asking, because we're talking a little bit about the TA, because he's saying, mm -hmm. uh, what have you guys, or what has your guys been, what has the schedule been like basically as a TA? Um, and so you just said they're pretty much accommodating. Um, yeah, so very much accommodating. Um, so you, 10 hours is the typical amount that you work as a TA. And so um, basically you have, you know, class once a week. Um, I chose to attend all of the classes because I thought it would be beneficial to me as well just to learn from students too. Um, sometimes you get to um, come up with your own presentation to share with students. So that might take a little bit of the time. That, that took a, a good bit of the time um, from my first experience, especially just because I was just getting into it and learning how to create a presentation to share with other students. Um, other than that, just like grading and reading essays and maybe meeting with the faculty that you work with, that comprises a lot of the schedule. Awesome. And uh, Lillian is asking, how did you find your mentor for your research? Would you guys like to talk about that, Kirsten? Sure. Um, 
I think I mentioned I was always interested in um, things like moral distress and things like that. And so I was very familiar with um, Dr. Carol Pavlish's work. Um, she's Professor Emeritus now, um, but I kind of just cold emailed her because I was so in love with all of the work that she did. Um, and she was so gracious and, you know, like just gave me a listening ear and was super supportive from the beginning. And we just really hit it off and she became my advisor. Um, and then uh, she's since, she's sort of, um, she's Professor Emeritus, so she's working on her retirement. So um, through the evolution of the program, I, I've now sort of transitioned to a new faculty chair, um, Dr. Heileman, um, but I still collaborate with Dr. Pavlish very much. She's also on my dissertation committee. And so it's cool to have support from all angles that way yeah and then i will also want to have that question be asked to sharice but but kristen can you also answer um this question about uh, uh can you tell us how your mentors work with you uh, throughout the different years yeah so can you talk about the missus or like the relationship that you've had with your with your mentors throughout the years especially since you know you and sharice are third years Sure, I, I know for me um especially going through coursework you know at least for me, my research question was not fully formed at the beginning. And um, so a lot of my uh, mentorship from Dr. Pavlish was in the form of thought partnering about, okay, I'm going through these courses, I'm learning more and more. This is sort of the evolution of my thought. What do you think about it? And she would just support those conversations and tell me to look at this literature and have you thought about this? And, um, and so our dialogue really helped solidify what it was I was even actually asking, if that makes sense. I don't know if any of you are in that boat where you're like, ooh, like I'm teetering on something, but I haven't formed it yet. Like, that's okay. I was definitely there. Um, sometimes as I'm writing my proposal, I'm like, am I still there? Like, I, I don't know. So um, it is just a constant evolution. But now transitioning to having my primary mentor um, as my faculty chair. Um, she is just a rock star in the methodology that, you know, Sharice and I are both using grounded theory. Um, she has also been a thought partner. Um, dialogue has been so important and she's also been so supportive. So I would say that they've carried very similar roles in my experience, um, even though um, the individual faculty members may have changed. Um, a lot of it has been supporting really rich dialogue and thought partnering. Um, so when I first um, reached out to faculty to discuss my research interest, they didn't particularly have a research interest in disability, but um, she was really all about like working with vulnerable communities. So I figured, okay, that's something that we could, could connect on. But that ended up not working out um, just because that particular faculty mem member had some personal issues that needed to be dealt with. So the conversation with my mentor back over at Charles Drew was just like, okay, who can we have you email to really connect with? But the exciting thing was that um, that same year that I was gonna be starting, there was the endowed chair of the disability study um, coming on on board to the university. So they were like, okay, you're definitely going to have someone that can work with you. So that was really nice um, because we have very similar interests and she's been such a major help throughout all my time here and really forming my research question and getting at exactly what I'm looking to, to find when I discuss these things with parents. So from year one to year three, it's just all been all been about just the dialogue that Kirsten talked about and really just trying to iron out what exactly I'm trying to do with my research. They've been great, very supportive. Awesome. And Yuri, since you're two weeks in, can you uh, talk about how you went about finding your mentor? Uh, sure. Uh, so, um, so first I started looking into like uh, where the faculties who has the same interest with me in the research population. Uh, so I actually have got some advice from my, you know, professor from my previous school. So it's, this is all about the match or so, you know, you you don't pick the school because of the school. We pick the school because of who is and who you want to work with. 
that so I actually really went to the many nursing school faculty pages and then found out who has the same interest with me, which is the intellectual disability. So cherished. I think we should uh, we have the same advisors, I guess. Um, then so another thing is actually really read a lot of uh, research articles or literature. So and then to make myself familiar with the names who are working in that specific population. So that's kind of how I narrow it down to the Dr. Clark, who is my advisor. Um, and then I actually found another um, faculty at another school as well. So that's kind of, I started like narrow it down uh, the schools I want to go because of those faculty members I found whose interest lies in my population. Then after that, I contacted them like, uh, like Kristen said, I emailed Dr. Clark directly because email address is on our school homepage. And then she was just so nice. And then since then we talked and then I'm here. So kind of like summarize. So I, I read a lot of literature in that research area and then went to the really crazy. <laughs> I, I actually spent a lot of hours to go into their different nursing schools or faculty members, their biography or their uh, CV, and then find out who I really want to work with. And I think I found the best match here. Awesome. That's great to hear. Sweet. OK, so Jonathan is asking, um, are classes on specific days, or are they all spread out throughout the week? Anybody want to take a stab at that? I can start. Yeah. Um, my classes are really spread. I have one class on Monday, two classes on Tuesday, uh, one class on Wednesday, and another class on Thursday. I'm off. I mean, I don't have class on Friday, but yeah, one class per day. That's kind of how my day is. And really fast, are yours all in person or any of them online? Uh, one is they call high flex, so you can go either in person or Zoom. And then uh, oh, two classes actually are like that. And then two classes are online. Thank you. Yeah. OK, Lisa is asking, uh, did you have anyone review parts of your application before you submitted? Uh, looking back, what advice do you have regarding the application process? What parts do you think uh, you might need to focus more on? So because I did the Bridges program through my nursing school, I did have someone look through and help me with the application. Um, I would say your focus should really be on why the PhD versus maybe like why did you choose the PhD over a DNP, for instance? Why is the PhD really important to you? And just kind of think broadly about the changes that you wish to see, especially regarding your research interest. That'll be something that's really important to focus on, I would say. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for bringing that up, especially the DNP versus PhD emphasis. Yeah. What about you, Kirsten? Uh, I think I definitely had um, my family look at my application and my, um, my mentors at the time look at my application. Um, people who had written my letters of recommendation, I also asked them to read my personal statements and things like that. Um, let's see, advice. Um, I, I agree wholeheartedly with Sharice. I think, um, you know, describing the changes that you want to see made is, can be really impactful. Um, and as I, you know, I, I'd said that I didn't really have my question fully formed even when I applied, I think just sort of being able to communicate how you're thinking through a problem is going to be important. Um, even if you don't have the exact answers as to how to go about answering it, you know, I, I imagine that's sort of the purpose of why you're pursuing, pursuing more training. But I think just, you know, communicating that you can think like a researcher is probably going to be really helpful. Great answer. Thank you for that. Um, any more questions, guys? We have a few more minutes. They're here for us. OK, we have one here. OK, let's see, from Shaylin. 
Yuri, I used that same technique. Um, I looked up faculty in the area of interest and, and first and then chose schools from there. Awesome, okay, and then it says, uh, the question is for everyone. I have reached out to faculty members in my area of interest waiting to hear back. Uh, my question is how soon should I reach out again? I know everyone is busy. So I'll, I'll go ahead and answer it. Um, if they haven't reached, if you waited a week, definitely email them again. Um, I, I would definitely do that. Um, it's a little bit different nowadays uh, because we all have our own personal phone line, um, but a lot of us are still working remotely from home. So email is probably the only contact. Usually I would say call the number as well. Um, but yeah, if they haven't answered in a week, I would definitely say reach out to them again. Um, a lot of times because they are busy, they may skip over to whatever the case is, but if you email them again, it's gonna be at the top of their, of their inbox. Um, so I would definitely do that. And if it has been, and let's say now we're working on a couple of weeks or, or whatnot, email me. And then what I can do is I can email that faculty member and CC you on it. Maybe if they see it come from me, uh, they, they would, you know, maybe chime in and answer it. So we'll try to do our best to make sure that, you know, we have our faculty reach out to you. Um, but that, that's coming for me. I don't know if you guys wanted to also fill in on that. You know, I had that issue too um, when I first reached out to the first faculty member when I was starting to think about applying. And I mean, after two weeks, I think is when I sent another follow up. But then um, because I had that UCLA connection with my mentors, they were able to inquire on my behalf. So, Mark, it's really helpful. Thank you for, you know, letting them know that they can also reach out to you and, and have that. That's helpful. Yeah, definitely. You know how the game is. Typically, it's always who you know, right? It's, it's yeah. kind of, you know, <laughs> you, get, you get things answered a little bit sooner. So, of course, if I can do anything on my part, I would try. Um, so, Shaylin, definitely uh, send that faculty or faculties uh, an email again. And if not, feel free to email me and I'll try my best to help you as well. Okay, so Lisa has a question. Um, how are you navigating funding? Uh, what percentage of students are securing scholarships? So are any of you guys um, receiving funding and or scholarships from the School of Nursing? Um, the School of Nursing has been very um, supportive. Um, I have received a fellowship from them once over the summer. And I also receive a fellowship from the graduate school. Um, that's been helping a lot too. And um, also just like working as the student researcher as well has been taking care of tuition and, and that kind of thing. So I think there's always opportunities out there. You just have to make sure you're, you know, reading through your emails because they do send you the information and applying when you can. It's, it's been good. Is it still the case, Mark, that um, for first year students there is coverage or? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, so that's awesome. So yes, that is still the case. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then moving forward with the opportunity of TA. Right, okay, yeah, that was really helpful that the first year was um, fully funded. Um, it, I think it helped to really give the opportunity to sort of focus on schoolwork um, if that was something that you wanted to do as a student. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, so uh, Karen had a question that I, um, had her follow up on. And so she has a question about um, like peer support, especially at a time during COVID. Um, so I know a lot of us, or at least this past year, especially for you, Kristen and Sharice, were spent, you know, everything, you know, via Zoom. Um, so how did you guys, I guess, as a cohort deal with supporting each other while in the program? Well, and or, you know, sometimes there's, sorry, to interrupt. I was gonna say sometimes, no, okay. sometimes there's just family support too, right, sort of thing, but is there a combination between the two? Yeah, for me, there's definitely a combination. My family has been very, very, very supportive. Um, and then in terms of the cohort, because we developed that bond um, the first year, because we were on campus together, um, that carried through even when we were doing it at home, we would make sure to have check-ins over Zoom. And like, you know, we have a Slack um, kind of group so that we can easily communicate and, and check in on each other and see how we're doing, share pictures, that kind of thing, uplift each other's spirits. So it's been really nice. I'm part of a really great cohort, so I'm thankful for that. 
I second everything Sharice says. She is an amazing peer, so inspiring. I think just this group is just, and I'm sure all of the cohorts, just such, such an amazing sort of resource of support. Um, and we have continued to stay in touch even, you know, now we're in post-coursework post, uh, phase. And generally that's the time that, you know, when you're sort of siloed in your own bubble doing your own dissertation work, it can be hard to stay connected, but, um, but we have, and I think it's a testament to sort of the, the bond that we forged early on and we're supported and um, through the program. Awesome. And I think you guys are part of the cohort, right? With Virgie and Lauren? Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Your, your card is awesome. Yes. Definitely know who you guys <laughs> Thank are. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah, you know, even awesome. speaking for Yuri, I know you're just, you know, a couple of weeks in, but just from what you're saying about you already knowing what your classmates are doing in terms of the work experience and all that just talks about the camaraderie and the bond and just the relationships you guys are already building because you are, you guys are already starting to get to know each other. And just oh, yeah. within two weeks, you could tell that that's a lot. So. Yeah. yeah like, so, well, first class, we were in person probably that helped too mm -hmm. but you know we are doing this together and it's not easy you know even from the beginning because of this quota system you know a lot of things we need to do so we kind of help each other remind okay which assignment do is when uh we like first week we actually already created the group text and then we actually text each other you know so just like we are trying to work together and move you know forward together and then because we are really like like-minded right we wanted to be here we are doing this together so it was very easy to make a bond and then connect that with my cohort awesome. everybody's just so nice here <laughs> <laughs> that's great awesome so i think we have like another minute or two um i don't want to hold you guys but if you guys had any more questions you want to put in there? Let's take the next few seconds. Um, but if not, this has been a great um, information session. And so I want to want to leave here for you guys or just some some keepers for today. Um, so really think about you know why you want to get into this program at UCLA. Uh, what does it mean to you to be a doctor? Right. Also think about what Sheree said in terms of a DMP and PhD. So no exactly what you know doctoral program you're thinking about getting into um, educational objectives are, are weighed heavily right so again a different type of research you're in uh, but don't be scared off if you think there's no specific match in terms of our faculty having the same exact research uh, research interests as you as dr Choi said that doesn't have to be the case we can still find a faculty advisor for you so that's one and then also, like uh, Dr. Devon was saying, in, in terms of selecting your references, just make sure that they know um, of your potential of, of being a great student um, and being successful as you continue throughout the program. So definitely take those and kind of think of those. And um, one more question, it looks like, which is coming from Lisa. Uh, are you taking any additional courses outside of the School of Nursing um, at UCLA? So like maybe something in public health? Um, well, for me, no additional courses outside of um, you, the School of Nursing. Well, I guess, I don't know if you count biostatistics as that, oh, but yeah. that's required. <laughs> so um, other than that, no, but I am doing a fellowship remotely with um, St. John Fisher in um, Rochester, New York. So that's been a really cool experience so far. That's kind of the additional thing for me. Yeah, I definitely took um, courses in the School of Public Health. I always said I was a public health groupie, um, but yeah, definitely there's that flexibility to be able to, to do that and cross-register. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So what I'm going to do here, if it's okay, I know I've, I've had you guys email up this whole time, um, and I probably should have asked you if it was okay to do so, um, but if it's okay, uh, would they be able to email you if they have any questions um, about, again, anything following up about you guys being students or just what it's like, you know, to be in the program and all those sort of things. Would it be okay if they reach out to you? Most definitely. Feel free. Send your emails. Awesome. Yes. Okay. Well, I, I, I do want to thank you three again for taking time, you know, out of your day. Um, I really do appreciate it. I know those that attended today appreciate it as well. So I wanted to say thank you again and enjoy the rest of you guys evening.
right. Thank you for having us. Take care. See you. Thank you. Bye now. Okay, so we'll go ahead and finish it off, um, which is actually the summary um, is just, again, I'm glad you guys were able to take time out of your day. Um, like I said, I wanted to keep you to 3.30. It's exactly 3.30 on the dot. Um, but again, thank you guys all for joining us today. If you guys have any other uh, questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'll be happy to meet you guys, set up a Zoom or whatever the case is. So without further ado, um, congratulations on taking this next step and we'll be talking soon. Thank you all. Good night.